Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our conference on uh, financing clean technologies. Uh, I'm Mauro Petriccioni, I'm the Director General for DG Clima and European Commission. Um, and uh, I will just say a few words of introduction uh, without taking too long. You're all familiar with the Innovation Fund, so I will not repeat things that you know. I would just like to say a word about the changing context in which we are going to operate. You will have heard the announcement by President von der Leyen that the Commission now proposes a new uh, reduction emission of emission target for 2030, at least 55%, as a better way to get to climate neutrality uh, in 2050. And we are convinced that that is a better way. However, it will have consequences. Um, for a start, it will mean front-loading more, more of the effort that we need to do over the next 30 years. And front-loading means two things. It means front-loading just transition efforts, because we'll have to cope with faster and more widespread change than would have been the case otherwise. But much more relevant to today's discussion, it means front-loading innovation in low-carbon technologies, uh, in research, in deployment of these technologies, and in investment. And that's why we are here today uh, to discuss. Public powers will do their part in this respect. The European Council has endorsed the multi-annual financial framework with the very relevant and important element, Horizon Europe, InvestEU, the cohesion funds, I will not go in, 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 into the whole list, but also next generation EU, the uh, recovery and resilience package, be deployed through national recovery and resilience plans. And the Commission is issuing guidance to member states that we want to see investment in those plans. We want to see productive investment, we want to see investment in new technologies in their deployment and the infrastructure that support them. Here, the Innovation Fund will have a very specific role. We see that as the tail end of an innovation pipeline. The part of the pipeline that helps bring new, clean, low carbon technology to the market. Our objective is to de-risk the initial deployment and help reach viability and competitiveness faster than would have been otherwise the case. But you know very well, the public investment will never reach the scale we need. Uh, public investment will be the trigger, but private investment must provide the scale. Um, and uh, we will de-risk the initial phase, but we will need help and cooperation and partners in doing so. so we need private investment uh, and we need institutional investors to participate uh, in this in this operation, and that's why most of you are here today. We offer opportunities in investing to invest in clean, low carbon innovation. We seek investors prepared to share risk with the Commission and bet on these technologies. Um, and uh, we want to discuss with you today how we can make that workable, useful, uh, and, and possible. And this is the end of the advertising blurb. So now let me get to the more important part of the conference, which is uh, the, begins with this panel, where we have uh, five distinguished speakers. Uh, we're very fortunate to have them uh, here today. And let me introduce them very briefly before I give them the floor for an initial presentation. We have Ville Molterer with us, who is the Managing Director of the European Fund for Strategic Investment at the European Investment Bank and who has had a very distinguished career in politics and in investment, and we're very fortunate to have him with us. Uh, we have Anne Mettler, whom I'm delighted to see again, former colleague of ours in the Commission, now Director for Europe in, of Gates Ventures. We have Ian Sim. Uh, Ian is the founder and chief executive of Impact Asset Management, and perhaps even at least equally relevant, he's a board member of the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change. And finally, we have Marco Mensing, Director General of CEFIC. Now, for those who are based in Brussels, Marco needs no introduction. 
Um, but for the other, uh, Marco is one of the key players in the interaction between European institution um, and industry, and he represents uh, one of the uh, big guns of European industry, uh, an industry which is complex, innovative, um, but also uh, difficult to change uh, because of its complexity and its uh, uh, and its reach. So, without further ado, um, let me give them the floor uh, for an initial presentation. And let me start with uh, Wilhelm Molterer. Uh, Wilhelm, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. I think uh, we are speaking about the biggest challenge uh, we are facing currently. We are discussing COVID, but the real big and long-term challenge is to deal with climate change. Climate change needs innovation. Innovation means, for me, at least three things. Innovation means a sound and strong research basis in Europe. Second, innovation means a public support for doing it and scaling it up. But innovation means also, thirdly, creative ways of financing of those innovative projects to achieve the target, this ambitious and rather bold target set by uh, Ursula von der Leyen. And here, I think, we have an experience where we can build on, and this experience is this uh, European Fund for Strategic Investment, call it Juncker Plan. This is better known in the public area. Why is it so? First of all, we had from the very beginning clear targets. And I think this is really what matters, clear targets. Van der Leyen had set this target, bold and clear. Second, we need a sound and a predictable regulation. I think this is something for private investors, uh, very, very important that they have to rely upon because we are talking about trillions of investment. Third element is the strong cooperation of all partners involved. Strong cooperation means in this respect, the commission, Strong cooperation means the European Investment Bank, National Promotional Bank, commercial banks, and all the other players in the, in the, in the area. A fourth component, Mauro, I would, I would tackle is, interestingly enough, my experience is we need a lot of advisory to go in a direction to have real good projects, because this is the precondition for private financiers to come in, real sound, good, projects. And the advisory component is for me a very critical element to achieve the targets. And last but not least, to attract the private sector is on the one hand the good and sound project basis, it means an asset class that's worth to invest into. Second, this predictable regulation. And third, a creative way of financing. And I think these are the elements uh, where we can, where we have to go and where we can achieve uh, the targets, even if they are ambitious. I remember when we started this exercise, the target of 500 billion investment incentivized was a bit, let's say, criticized. Is this realistic? By end of this year, we will make way more than 500. And second, we have implemented the target to achieve 40% out of this investment climate related, related. We will make it. And third, what's really positive, the second most sector after SME support is R, D, and I. And this makes me really happy that we can showcase, thanks to FC, we do have instruments at hand, Commission, EIB, National Promotional Banks, and others, and we can attract private capital to make it reality. Well, um, many thanks. Uh, in a very short presentation, you've already put quite a lot of food for thought on the table, so good start. Uh, let me remind the audience that they can ask questions via Slido, and please don't wait until we open the question time for the audience. Um, whenever you have a question, put it on the, um, on the chat, and uh, uh, we will collect them as we go along, and when we finish the round of presentation, I will... Um, uh, pick a number of them, depending on the time we have, 
uh, and ask our speakers to uh, to reply. So let's move on, uh, and let me ask now Anne to uh, for her introduction. Mm -hmm. Anne, please, Excellent. you have the floor. Thank you so much, uh, Mauro, and uh, also great to see you again, of course. So I'm very pleased, actually, to join you uh, this morning for what I believe, just like Lily, is a very, very important uh, discussion. And let me also say, I mean, as sort of a lifelong student of uh, political change and economic reform, these are actually extraordinarily exciting times. I was so, so happy to see that our commitment uh, to climate neutrality uh, has not been derailed uh, by COVID, which is what I think some of us were, were worried about. And actually, it seems to the pandemic in some strange way has seemed to strengthen our resolve. Uh, it has made us more ambitious. We spoke about the increase in uh, the target up to 55% of emission reductions by 2030. So this is really, really important that we seize the moment and that we really match sort of the political vision and ambition now with delivery and uh, action. And uh, actually, I, you said it, uh, Mauro, in your own introduction, we need to front load innovation, but that's of course easier said than done. Because for sure, I mean, as I just said, we set the bar quite high politically. And politicians, I think rightly and hopefully now feel under quite a bit of pressure to deliver. But there are really quite a, quite a lot of challenges ahead. In a recent study, the International Energy uh, Agency made an important point. Half of the emission reductions uh, that, we, uh, that are required to reach net zero uh, by uh, mid-century actually rely on technologies that have not yet been commercialized. So these are technologies that may exist, but they're not yet in markets. So that's why these emerging clean technologies, which we are talking about here, and what they need in terms of regulation, in terms of financing, that should really, really be central to the public discourse now. And that's in this regard, I just wanted to make three uh, quick uh, points, if I may. Firstly, it's really important to understand that clean tech innovation is really quite different from innovation, let's say, in digital or in biotech. And uh, so, so the innovation cycle, the time from the development of a technology to the time that it becomes affordable and really widely diffused takes much, much longer. So we know from wind and solar, the innovation cycle tended to take up to 25 years which is of course time we simply don't have in the, in the face of the climate emergency. So we need to figure out ways to compress and to really accelerate the innovation cycle for these clean technologies. And that's of course, I mean, a formidable challenge if I can say, particularly for Europe, we are known for many things, but we're not necessarily always known for speed. So better understanding the dynamics of the innovation cycle and what aspects can be accelerated, I think should really be a focal point in our discussion. The second point uh, I wanted to make is when we speak about emerging technologies, it's important to understand that these technologies may be at a different level of maturity. So some are real innovation bets. Uh, they are very risky. The return is far off but they may be hugely promising in terms of future emission reductions. And some technologies, on the other hand, may already be ready to scale. And so both categories will have completely different needs in terms of regulation, in terms of policy, and in terms of finance. And this is also um, in a study that we recently commissioned that will actually come out soon. And in it, in the study, we distinguish between innovation bets, secondly, um, innovation acceleration and scale up. So these are technologies that are ready for validation and demonstration. And that's, of course, perhaps what we'll be talking about today, since these are the technologies that the innovation fund is targeting. And the third category is called drive to market scale technologies, which are in a later stage development and are really ready to be scaled up. And the study recommends that we have a more varied view 
of emerging climate technologies, taking into account the maturity levels and then building up a portfolio of these technologies that covers the entire innovation cycle. As it is, we are actually quite good in R&D, but less good at deployment and scaling up. And what we need is, of course, really sort of three steps. We need discovery, deployment, and diffusion. Huh? That's the innovation cycle. So the third point goes to the financing needs that different technologies need according to their maturity and according to where they find themselves in the innovation cycle. The commission actually has already quite an impressive range of funding instruments. Horizon Europe and EIC Pathfinder for the R&D stage, the Innovation Fund and Innofin EDP and the EIC Accelerator for the validation and early deployment phase and InvestEU for some of the later stage uh, technologies. So we're covering the innovation cycle, but it's not enough. Um, I think it was Willie and also Mauro, you, you said the public sector cannot do this alone. So let me say a few words about private sector finance. What emerging climate tech mostly needs is patient and risk tolerant capital. And that is why Bill Gates initiated Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which is a $1 billion fund that invests in early stage technology companies that have the potential to significantly reduce uh, CO2 emissions in the range of half a gigaton. So some of you may have actually heard of Breakthrough Energy Ventures Europe, which is what I think is really sort of a one of a kind pilot program that leverages private capital with public funding for clean technologies. It's a 100 million uh, euro fund um, with 50 million coming from the commission and the EIB and 50 million coming from Breakthrough Energy Ventures. And in my opinion, Breakthrough Energy Ventures Europe has the potential to be transformational, not because of the 100 million that's in it, but because it has set a precedence uh, for really a new kind of public-private partnership that hitherto has not existed. And this kind of new way of working together, stripping out some of the bureaucracy and the heaviness uh, and really sort of scouting for the new technologies, what are the most exciting and best startups that bring out these technologies? That's a genuinely new way of working. And I would actually describe it sort of as breakthrough public policy. Uh, by the way, I would consider the Innovation Fund breakthrough public policy because it is also a very new way of doing things. So let me also say on the finance side, and I'm about to wrap up, but I wanted to make two more points. Firstly, I think we're neglecting philanthropy. I already spoke about the need for patient risk tolerant capital. I think that's rather unlikely to come from banks or traditional VC funds because the returns oftentimes are far off and they're actually quite uncertain. So it's important that we think more about philanthropy, what it can do, and also maybe zero in on investors that have a longer time horizon and less return uh, expectations, such as family offices, and there are quite a few of them in Europe. A second interesting development is the creation of carb markets and their potential to finance the development of emerging climate technologies. The ETS is of course an example of such a carbon market which made the innovation fund possible. But just two weeks ago, for example, Mark Carney announced a task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets, which seeks to grow the voluntary carbon markets um, 15 fold between now and 2030. So if that will happen, and as more and more companies make very bold and sizable commitments, financial commitments to meet their climate uh, targets through voluntary offsets, this has the potential to be a very, very sizable market. And we should make sure that at least some of that goes into these emerging clean technologies. So in conclusion, let's hone in on the innovation cycle and see how we can accelerate it. Let's dig a little bit deeper to understand the maturity of the various sort of clean technologies that are in the pipeline. And let's mobilize as much 
patient capital, patient and risk tolerant capital as we can. And if we do that, I really believe Europe is in pole position to be at the forefront of what is by all accounts a new technology revolution that is unfolding and that others are also trying to get into. So it's important that we be fast and we believe in it. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Anne. Always a pleasure listening to you. Uh, and not least because of your enthusiasm. Um, Ian, um, we heard from Anne about patience and uh, long-term view. Uh, I think uh, you, given your position, you're ideally placed to tell us something about that, but more generally about how do you see um, uh, this debate and investment in clean tech. You have the floor. Thank you, Mauro. Good morning, everybody. Um, my team at Impacts and I first started investing in clean energy in the late 1990s. So uh, since the, we're still around, I suppose that's one definition of, of patience. In the late 1990s and early 2000s, there was talk about fuel cell vehicles representing 10% of all new vehicles by 2010. Governor Schwarzenegger in California was promising a hydrogen superhighway and the cost of solar panels was uh, so high that it was only possible for rich people to, to buy them. Now, in the last 20 or so years, there's obviously been a huge amount of, of upheaval and transformation in energy markets in all dimensions. But institutional investors have also started to play their part in this space. It's now possible to finance wind and on, onshore wind and solar projects without subsidy and without any um, policy intervention beyond the normal project planning support. Offshore wind in the last five years has become pretty much fully commercial. And now there is some um, talk in many circles about the electric vehicle charging infrastructure being largely funded by the private sector with very little in the way of public policy subsidy. So we've learned a lot in the last 20 years, and I think it's very important to reflect on what institutional investors are thinking about clean energy, clean tech opportunities over the next 30 years. I think the starting point has to be that the uh, rising of climate change at the agenda for the whole society has um, awoken institutional investors in larger numbers than ever before. And that's represented, for example, in the number of members of the Institutional Investor Group on Climate Change, which has been growing exponentially as institutional investors around Europe seek to understand what's going on and try and understand risk and opportunity more broadly. However, I think it's also important to just reflect briefly on what institutional investors do. What is their job? Essentially for pension funds, it's to pay pensioners and the liabilities that they face are mapped out over many decades. Insurance companies obviously have to um, husband their capital and um, provide a, an acceptable rate of return on a fully commercial basis in a very competitive market. Venture capital funds are typically funded by a combination of institutional and, and private capital, but they are operating across the wide spectrum of, of technology or businesses. There are not too many of them that are entirely dedicated to clean tech. So as everybody knows in this space, it remains quite challenging to attract institutional capital directly into technology development. And I think the best way of thinking about the role that institutional investors can play in this area is to catalyze the pull effect by initially backing the larger businesses that are transforming themselves either from fossil fuel suppliers or um, e explorers into clean energy companies, for example, the big oil majors, the big transportation companies that are um, experimenting and alive to opportunities to completely reposition their transportation fleets and energy users in industry and commerce everywhere who are under enormous pressure now to switch away from fossil fuels. That has to be the starting point for institutional investors. But the pull effect that the capital investment by those large groups represents will of course drag through with increasing speed the prospects and opportunities for the more targeted service companies that are providing clean technology. And the development and expansion of those companies uh, in turn will attract entrepreneurs, innovators, private companies, and um, finally, there will be a very strong and increasing pull effect all the way back to universities and, and research labs. So it's best to think, in my view, of the institutional investor role in this as catalyzing the pull effect. Um, 
to make sure that equities and bonds in listed markets are ideally placed for success over the next couple of decades as we move towards a more sustainable economy and that real assets owned by institutional investors either in real estate or infrastructure are resilient both against the physical effects of climate change but also the transformation that we're going to see in the economy as energy prices move dramatically uh, for retail and wholesale suppliers. So just switching to um, to the policy scene, I think from the private sector perspective, we're in um, quite an interesting place because we now have a very clear perspective or target for where we want to get to as a society. Net zero by 2050 has to be um, a rallying cry for everybody around the world. As I've described to some degree, we now have probably 30 years of experience about what works in deploying at scale clean technologies, not just in energy, but across the environmental spectrum. We also know what doesn't work and some very important learning to remember. And thirdly, and most intriguingly, we've never had cheaper money. So the last 250 years of, of um, capitalism post the Industrial Revolution, money's never been cheaper. So that should give us huge hope that with the right technology mix, we should be able to scale up the solutions to help mitigate climate change rapidly. I think as, as Anne has touched on um, in, the last, in the last speech, um, there is a, a different role to be played by technology in different areas. I would add optimization to, to the list. Um, it's important not to forget that the, the current suite of technologies, even in solar um, and wind, can be improved further. So we should make sure that we are optimizing what we already have. We need to demonstrate new projects based on existing technology that's not yet commercial and experiment with what works for those projects in the real world, in the real marketplace. I'm thinking, for example, of um, CCUS, uh, carbon capture utilization and storage, uh, which does work in, in a uh, technical sense, but hasn't yet been proven to be economic. We need to, to invest more in demonstration. And of course, we need to demonstrate that various parts of the hydrogen economy do actually work in practice all the way from production through to deployment in in homes and, and businesses. Then, of course, there is the, uh, the, the research and development uh, focus, which, of course, this conference is particularly interested in. We're going to need new technologies beyond 2050 because it's quite likely on a global basis that we won't be able to decarbonize by then. And so uh, alongside the demonstration of projects and technologies that we want to deploy at scale in the 2030s, then we're going to be Need, we need to invest now in the R&D for technologies that will be necessary beyond 2050 at a commercial scale. So just a, a, a few recommendations for um, what I believe works in terms of the combination of policy and finance. I think markets have to be a, a central point. If you're going to attract large volumes of institutional capital, it's really important to focus on designing markets in which technology can play a role. I'm thinking in particular about the rise of distributed generation and the need for policymakers to shape viable commercial markets for, for example, um, grid balancing services or the two-way flow of power to enable uh, viable distributed generation at small scale. I think it's really important to think about clean tech in the whole value chain. This is very different, as Anne says, from consumer-based technology where the route to market is much shorter Typically in clean tech, you need a huge industrial ecosystem to move for your technology to be viable. So those who are trying to catalyze new technology innovation need to think about the value chain. The hydrogen economy is, is a very good illustration of the need to, to work in all areas of the value chain. Thirdly, it's important to look at price points. The new technology is only valid um, as a substitute for old technology if it can provide the consumer with an equal or better level of service at an attractive price point. We saw that solar power became competitive because the Chinese followed the Germans in particular in subsidizing the manufacturing of solar panels. That was for society a very expensive way to get there, i.e. to cheap solar power, but it did bring about change relatively quickly. The key point was getting the price of electrons down. And fourthly, we need global coordination. So um, I would strongly encourage you within the European Union framework to, to think about how you can connect with um, similar ventures and initiatives in Asia, in uh, the Americas, and in particular for these new fuel or uh, vector um, supplies like hydrogen, there needs to be a global effort. So in conclusion, I'm very optimistic that the capital will be there to 
projects to finance the rollout and diffusion of technologies over the second half of the 2020s and into the 2030s. I do think we've got a lot of very positive experience as private sector investors for seeing how, how this can work and what the rewards are for early movers in the space. I think I'm really encouraged that policymakers, as evidenced by this forum, are increasingly literate about um, how private capital works and are reaching out across the, the divide, if I can describe it like that, to build conversations, build understanding and build a collaborative conversation for how to shape policy frameworks that will quickly catalyze uh, transformations in these key industries. So I'm really pleased to be up have the opportunity to speak to you today and uh, hand the floor back to you, Mara. Many, many thanks, Ian. Very, very interesting. Uh, lots to come back to. Uh, we've heard from the financiers so far. Uh, let's hear from those who can use that finance. Marco, um, your industry is big, capital intensive. Um, your industry has money and needs money. To, uh, to progress. Tell us your view, uh, among other things, about uh, what are the financial challenges for the uh, chemical sector as it seeks to decarbonize, and um, what are your expectations from the uh, clean tech finance world? Marco, you have the floor. Thanks, Mauro. I, I hope you can hear me well. Um, and thank you for having me on the panel this uh, this morning. Um, I'm really happy to be here, which you normally say on every panel, um, but in this case, I really, really am very happy to be here. And the reason is that the Innovation Fund could be the birthplace of my industry's future. Um, we have many activities in Brussels. Um, I followed this one since the initial amendments in the parliament trying to set up the fund. And I'd like to give a compliment to you, Mauro, and the team. Um, with Christian, um, uh, with Melina and colleagues for persevering and making this, this reality. And that's a compliment I, I honestly mean. Um, it's a big achievement that we're here today. It's a big achievement that we're here today where I'm the only industry guy on a panel, and that's not that special, but that there's bankers, investors, and people we normally don't really talk to. Um, Ian said, it's good that you start to understand the way private equity thinks. That applies for us as well. It's good to understand how CEOs make investment decisions and connect that to, uh, to policy. Um, I had a discussion with your predecessor, Jos Del Beck in Florence not so long ago, who said, what training courses should we give in the Florence School of Policy? And I said, the one is missing in all the climate change trainings is how do CEOs make investments? It should actually be uh, a major training course for policymakers. Because the better we understand that, the better we can, can bring the change. Um, and it's not for nothing, Florence was the, the birthplace of the Renaissance. Maybe now here we are at the birthplace of the industry of the future. Um, so much for philosophy, but I think it's really important to stimulate this fund. Um, and you see the interest of our companies um, in the amount of applications we expect on the, on the first round as well. On, um, Tuesday, I was in my Chinese um, CEO forum, which we do every day. I should normally have been in China this week. And I think it's important to make that reference because with President Xi's announcement for the 2060 climate neutrality, um, we are not only in competition with the Chinese on the global chemical production, soon they're 60%. We're now also in the race for decarbonization technologies with the Chinese. And I can tell you in the statements of the Chinese around the table this week, um, they're moving. And in a number of cases, they're moving even faster than us. They're coupling that with OBOR, one belt, one road, which brings those technologies at our doorstep. And that's how we, we look at the fund. We need to make sure that what's invented in Europe is not only demonstrated in Europe, but then invested in Europe and that actually we get the first of a kind new technologies um, in Europe by 2030, um, operational working. Um, and that's where I think the fund, but also the recovery package now has a huge role to play, which we're going to use. So a few words on my sector. If you look at the chemical industry, from pharma to petrochemicals, specialties, and, and the more commodity chemicals, 
if you look at it in terms of uh, emissions, quite the largest number of companies will depend on renewable electricity and heat being abundantly available. Then there is a number of technologies where we need to do it much more efficient. We need the electrolyzers of the future to kick us into hydrogen. Can be made more efficient, work needs to be done. And we need breakthroughs like methane pyrolysis, like the electric trackers, new furnaces, which are not yet there. We have three consortia working on those, still some time to, uh, to come. That reduction is not linear. And when you see the front loading of innovation, and we've seen that in the impact assessment under the 55% target, you see electricity is thought to do about minus 70 in 2030, industry minus 25 compared to 2015, which means that right after the breakthroughs need to be available to get us from 2030 to 2050 and into the, uh, the climate neutrality. So in that sense, the curve, which has been there for quite long, means um, strong improvements now, but after 2030, um, availability of breakthroughs. And then after 2030, um, as I said, ambition to have them invested here. Um, what pains me is we had the first announcement of a climate neutral uh, large petrochemical complex in India. And that's where I think we should unite and get our act together with the investors in Europe, with the industry, with the CEOs, with the policymakers, um, that indeed we have those first of a kinds here. And that's where the innovation fund can play a role. Um, in our description of the fund, it's more or less a soap box. And I'd like to finalize there. In global investment decisions, CEOs with their shareholders, um, global CEOs looking at Europe, Europe is a stable population and a stable market. Um, it actually has the opportunity of the African market south of us growing massively, where very soon there could be more Nigerians than Europeans alone. So there is a huge opportunity south, but we are quite a stable market. If you want to invest in new technology, the logic is to do it in the most carbon intensive and growing markets, which are not Europe. So not only we need this soapbox for our investments to stand on to get the global intention, but it's both CAPEX and OPEX. And we need to find a way to indeed convince that these investments start in a surrounding, which is the, the, the birth chamber, which is the safe environment to do things in a completely new way. Um, and the only way we can achieve that is indeed chemical industry, um, um, other industries, bankers, investors, policymakers, with a European focus on sometimes we say in German stunt or uh, Europe, if we can get that organized and done. Um, we think those opportunities are there. Um, that's why we're here as well. We also think it's important it happens. And that's just the last word on the pandemic. During the pandemic, we found out one thing, which is how interconnected value chains are. When leather tanneries were closed, we lost gelatine, which were used for fungi. <laughs> Why this, this example? We need to have the solar production, the wind production in Europe. We also need the chemicals for the solar cells and wind panels in Europe in those strategic value chains. And that's where you get in the combination. Um, have the new technologies here, keep those sectors, steel, cement, chemicals in Europe, then have the building blocks to get your new technologies in other areas as well. So very happy, um, lots more to tell, but I'll rest it here, Mauro, over to you. Many thanks, Marco, uh, many, many thanks. Uh, we've started having questions from the audience, uh, a number of them addressed to a number of you, but there is one question which seems to be recurrent. I've had at least uh, three or four that rotate around the same issue. And I want to ask that to our first three panelists, the financiers, so to speak. Um, it's about the interfaces between the Innovation Fund and uh, what you do and the activities that you finance um, and the activities that uh, uh, you would be interested in financing. There's quite a bit of interest in the audience about understanding how do you choose what you want to finance? Uh, and obviously, in with a reference to this particular field, to to um, uh, to climate. Um, so let, let me ask uh, um, uh, 
the first three panelists on, on in, in perhaps in reverse order, starting with Ian. Yes, that's a, um, a very good question. Look, I think when we're making investments, we're not much different to our peers, which is that we, we want to see a number of factors in place. We want to see that there is the potential for a large market to emerge in time. And this is not just going to be a niche opportunity. We want to see that the investment which is being offered has the potential for robust competitive advantage within that market. And that might be through intellectual property, through um, patents, et cetera, or it might be through um, clever processes and know-how that can be protected through, um, th through sound management. We want to see that the route to market is clear, that, for example, if the technology is uh, targeting the transportation sector, that it's realistic that the large original equipment manufacturers who will be the end customers of it, for example, um, will likely move to adopt it in their uh, subsequent product cycles, product cycles there typically being seven or so years. We want to make sure that the management team behind the technology has the experience both um, in the value chain of, of the specific industry, but also around more general technology developments and understanding how to build optionality and resilience into a tech-based business. We need to see that the total capital investment required by the business being put forward to us is likely to be realistic um, and fundable either by ourselves or by um, current investors because we don't want to invest in something which then leads to massive dilution of our interests because capital has to come in much more expensively down the road. There are, there are many other factors um, that we look for in general. So I think specifically for the innovation fund, I would encourage those managing it to, if this has not been done in depth already, to build ongoing dialogues with industrial players in the key um, industries who may be customers for the businesses that the fund will back, um, to build dialogue with um, policymakers who are shaping the markets that, as I mentioned, need to get to scale, and to understand how to manage and recruit talent. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thanks, Ian. Anne, would you like to give your yes. uh, take on this, please? So, so I would speak from the experience that we had with uh, Breakthrough Energy Ventures, which I already mentioned before. So here, the criteria, the main and overriding criteria is the potential of a future emission reduction. So I already said that the expectation would be that the technology being developed could lead to a uh, half a gigaton uh, reduction in uh, CO2. So that's very clear. That's also a very high threshold, I would say. There is, uh, in Breakthrough Energy Ventures, really very little to no return expectation. So no expectation return on the investment. Uh, so it's important to look at the, um, the composition of the fund is really sort of around high net worth individuals. Uh, these are people who care about climate uh, and uh, that really have the means to invest in such a fund. Uh, so this is, goes back to what I said earlier about the risk tolerant patient capital. So these are people who were able to make that possible. But on the other side of this is really a world-class team that consists both of investment professionals so some of these people have come out of Silicon Valley. They are deeply immersed with a sort of the business of investment. But what our team has that I think is truly distinctive, it has incredibly talented scientists embedded in that team. Uh, virtually all of them have PhDs. They are really distinctive uh, and, uh, and uh, recognized leaders in their field. Uh, the team itself is led by the person who uh, used to uh, be the head of RFIE, which is, of course, the, 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 the um, uh, government uh, incubator for energy innovation in the United States. 
So the important point sort of about our approach is there is a belief that the first wave of clean tech didn't succeed because in the investment teams, science was not embedded to the extent uh, that, uh, that it has to be. So science and evidence is really part and parcel of what we do. In fact, we have now an entire team called Bright for Energy Sciences uh, that will do nothing than sort of bring you the, the scientific underpinning with which uh, we do our work. A little bit like what the Commission, the Commission, the Joint Research Center is. We will have that embedded in all of our actions uh, uh, as part of Bright for Energy. So um, this is another sort of distinctive feature, I would say. And then thirdly, it's really about scouting for the best ideas. And this is a little bit maybe something to reflect on because we know that in European funding programs, it's always through applications. So you really need to come forward with an application. Here we are scouting. We are really sort of have an overview of what are the most promising technologies and what are the most promising companies. So the scouting element, I think, is also really important uh, to understand. And uh, it's my hope that uh, the, at least the Innovation Fund makes itself knowledgeable enough that even, I mean, you cannot scout for it, but that you at least attract those companies that are developing uh, the most uh, uh, promising technologies to apply for funding in the Innovation Fund. Thank you, Anne. Wilhelm, you represent a very special investor. The uh, European Investment Bank is uh, um, not uh, like many other institutions. And uh, the bank is also very active in being transparent on the, um, on the criteria it uses. But what's your take about this? How do you see the interaction with the, with the fund and the, how do you see and what is the bank looking for from uh, uh, from the investment it wishes to uh, uh, to follow? Well, first uh, question, Mao. What is what is the list of criteria? And I think that's rather rather clear. First of all, it's about the quality of the project, and the quality of the project is based on 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 on, on three assumptions. The one is, is it really technically sound, is it innovative, means we do have a lot of engineers, they are looking deeply into the, into the details of the project. Secondly, is it economically sound and it, does it fit to all you, you know, the compliance needs? That's for a public institution like EAB absolutely relevant. First, therefore, quality of the project. Second, does it fit to policy targets, into the policy targets? And this is extremely important for a public bank like the EAB, the Bank of the European Union. Climate is the driver also of our activities because we are developing ourselves towards the EU Climate Bank. That means the, 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 the contribution to, the, to achieving the target is extremely important. And the third element, is it additional? What is additional? Are we crowding in private capital and are we not crowding out the private ones? Is one of the key questions. Because our role is, as said, to be additional to market, to be additional also to the grants world. These are the three main components. The quality of the project, the policy targets, and is it additional? The second thing, therefore, is, and I go back to what Anne had said at the beginning. If you look at the cycle, you see the most critical phase is the phase where innovation starts, where you do have the risk of a project that's not covered by private capital in total, and where you need the, the, the perfect combination of grants and financial instruments. And therefore, I see a huge opportunity from this innovation fund to combine this with InvestEU as the financial instruments uh, uh, delivery arm. And this blending of grants and this, this using of these uh, new financial instruments like InvestEU or now FC is a perfect fit to cover really the needs because it's taking risk on the public shoulders and therefore it's, it's attracting private capital to go into. I think this is extremely important, but this needs a third component, Mauro, and I find this fascinating. 
if you talk about innovation, you should not talk just about technology. You have also to talk about the innovation part in the public policy sphere and to be innovative also in the financial sector, in the capital market. And here something is, uh, what I heard, is really a critical element. We do have in the meantime quite a well-developed, I would say, uh, financial support in the, in the, in the, in the R&D sector. We have a venture capital market that's way better that, than before five years back, also thanks to the coordination and cooperation, for instance, with the Gates Venture and other venture funds. But we do have still a lack in the equity. And equity is a key question specifically for growing and scaling companies. And here we need the private sector supported by public institutions like Commission or the EIB. And my last point is, we should know a bit better also the sectors what we are talking about, because all the sectors have different needs. We were talking about energy, we were talking about mobility, we were talking about industry, but I see needs also in the housing sector. I see also need in land use, means agriculture, that means we should go, we should broaden a bit the scope because the different sectors needs different instruments. But for all of them, the same need is there. Take risk on the public shoulder, shoulders and attract private capital to go into. And therefore the blending, for instance, InvestEU and Innovation Fund is a fantastic way. Maybe also it's a good model for blending also with national sources. Because as Ian had, Ian had said, we do have so much money around that's looking desperately for, I would say, asset classes. They are attractive, but they are also in the long term sustainable and not are turning them into stranded as, uh, assets. That's the fascinating time we are in now. Mauro, can I just make a, a brief point to build on what Willem has just said? Sure, go ahead. I think uh, Willem made the point that support of the fund doesn't crowd out private sector capital, but I think the opposite is also true. And I've, I've been very encouraged by the response of private investors seeing that a particular project is backed by the European Investment Bank. But that will, will allow them, give them confidence that the policy landscape is supportive. Because one of the key concerns for the private market is where is policy going? There's so much um, choice and there's so many blind alleys. And if the European Union through the bank can signal that a particular investment is consistent with policy by putting European money behind it, that's a very strong positive signal. That's true. The quality stamp of EAB is most welcome in the private sector. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Ian. That's a very valid, valid point. But I want to come back in a minute to a point that Willem made about equity. But first, let me ask Marco. Uh, Marco, would your archetypal CEO recognize himself or herself in what you heard from uh, Ian, Anne and Wilhelm? Uh, how, how do you see it from your angle? I, I think they do, but I think there's a, there's a few elements missing and, and there's answers in the European mix. So first, infrastructure will be crucial, which we're not discussing here. If you look at the decarbonization, it's the massive amount of renewable electricity, the pipelines for hydrogen, the, the cross-border interconnectors, which I think can come from regional funds, structural funds, smart specialization. There's lots of money around as well, but that's the condition to get things done. Uh, the same with CCU and CCS and pipelines and what have you. The second thing is that um, still global CEOs find Europe very unpredictable. Um, and that's not to be to be impolite, but sometimes what they tell me is we hope Europe is the canary that survives the coal mine. Um, it's too unpredictable. We're getting um, now for the first time a 2050 target, which is clear, but be aware as well that over the years, uh, the targets have changed every parliament as well. So this, this long-term perspective now, I think really makes the change in order for them to feel more comfortable. What's also there is that um, they find it hard to, and that's what we're going to need to cooperate with other companies within the constraints of DG Comp. What you're talking about is consortia, 
the risk of building a new cracker is so big, it's not a single company alone. And I think that's where we can also, also learn from um, working with, for example, the Gates Foundation. But maybe last but not least, so far the impression also on the EIB side is that mostly projects that get funded were bankable projects. And the answer I always got was if they're bankable, we'll go to a bank. We don't need public support. Now, there is almost like a race ongoing in the next uh, 10 years with highly risky projects. And that, that's where I'd like to make the split. If it's high risk or high opportunity, the CEOs will do it themselves because that means they win the global race. If it's never going to uh, be interesting, whatever subsidy you support, they're not going to do it either. In the middle are those projects which are very interesting, could be crucial, but too risky and you don't have the money yet. And that's where this is, I think, a great tool where um, the CEOs are very carefully watching and you will see it in a number of applications. But even with all this, they still might have to go to a global CEO who says, yeah, but why in Europe? Because they give me the same in India or in China or the Chinese would even be um, um, more interested. Now, I think the convincing part here is to have on here, to have the EIB here, the private equity. That's the argument that will make them talk. But what's missing, uh, because you're talking to me, is bilaterals with the CEOs. I actually believe that's where the discussions are now happening, but also take a huge hydrogen electrification project, bilateral meetings with a power sector CEO, a chemical CEO, local government and the funds, and sit down how we can do it. Um, now, I'm not in the financial world, maybe that's, that's more uncommon, but there's a lot to learn on our side still. Um, that is a, as a first, uh, first reply. I hope that makes some sense. Let me follow up on that. Uh, because something you just said uh, mixes very well with the number of questions we've been receiving from the audience. Let me turn now, I, I don't want to have this a ping pong between industry and financiers, but that interface is something that we need to understand. We as policymakers, we need to understand not only how industry works, not only how finance works, but how can they work together? And I think to, to, to paraphrase what Marco was saying, um, how do we make them attractive to each other uh, in a way that hasn't happened before with a clear orientation, which is not just, well, whatever works better in the market, whatever produces more jobs, but also um, what produces wealth, jobs, and a policy objective, which is uh, stopping climate change. So let me turn to um, to our three other uh, panelists. And one of the questions we received from the audience is, if you saw a technology which you consider promising, uh, mature, uh, but the market isn't, uh, will you still back it? Uh, because that's one of the cases that Marco was talking about. Uh, a CEO would look at what does it cost me to start a new technology? Will it work? But also, can I sell it? Uh, so, any of you wants to chip in on this one? Yeah. Well, I can I can say a word because that's also a bit linked to what we have just recently discussed. First of all, I enjoy and I love the discussion because that's really what's about this interface and this inter interconnection amongst the, the financiers and the 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 the, the, the yeah, the industry. First of all, and here for me the main point comes in three different directions. First, I think we should consider way more intensive the way how we align EU money and EU resources and EU funds. Because this is really sometimes criticized also from the industry and the, the, the business people that you have so many different regulations in place with the same target. If we align all these EU funds, this is something that would help immediately. And therefore, InvestEU is such a clever move because InvestEU did really this, this concentration of various instruments into one tool. It's predictable. That's the second big thing. It's predictable. And the third question, the bankability, First of all, yes, uh, we are a bank. That means, Marco, we do also want to have our money back. We, that we are obliged by our, by our shareholders, which are the member states. But what we can do 
in comparison to the, to the commercial banks, we can take more risk and we can take more risk based on the guarantee agreements we do have with the commission or other mandators. This is the whole idea also from FC. The FC guarantee is 33 billion. This turns out into 500 whatever billion investment. And the, 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 the lump sum in between is practically private capital. Bankability is not a bad word. If we add an additional risk bearing and the risk bearing comes from the public sector. And I think therefore it's not an either or because either or is always blocking progress. It should be replaced by and. And if we do this, it's not either or, it is public and private engagement. We need to understand each other way better. And therefore I'm so happy to have this uh, conversation today, also based on the practical experience we have gained over the last couple, uh, couple of years. Not an either or, we need both. No, I'm hey, also hey, Steven, and you want yeah. to add something? Yes, so, I mean, we would definitely be interested. I mean, if there was the, the uh, I always spoke about our sort of uh, uh, threshold of half a gigaton reduction in CO2. If there was such a technology that was promising, even if there was no market, we would definitely be interested. But let me say one of the one of the overriding challenges I think we are facing here is that for many of these technologies, there really is no natural market per se because the products are not really distinctive. If you have clean or dirty cement, they more or less they're the same, right? The same with steel, the same with electricity, green electricity or a sort of dirty electricity. So you don't, you really need to rethink the market because what is offered in the market is not really distinctive to the consumer. So that poses an additional challenge, I would argue. And one of the things that we're thinking very much about is what Bill calls the green premium that we have to pay. Because the truth is, we have a lot of the clean technologies that we need, but they're more expensive. So no one's buying them or it's very difficult to buy them. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about how do we reduce this green premium? How do we bring down the price? Because just emission reduction without being able to reduce the price and therefore expand the market won't work. I mean, we have seen this, for instance, in solar. It only really took off when the price came down. So this is actually a big challenge for the commission, I would argue, is not just to think about the technology push, but also the demand pull that will be needed. And here, yeah, I know the commission is thinking about these uh, carbon contracts uh, for difference, but there's also one might think of sort of reverse auction. One might think about buyers clubs for clean steel or clean cement. There's all sorts of things that must be done here. But keep in mind, this is not a typical market per se. So we really need policymakers to engage with these challenges and help us figure this out so that we make it more attractive and incentivize the use of these clean technologies over the, the, the dirty and fossil fuel reliance. Yeah, Maybe I can just talk. Have you got a different perspective than uh, a public bank or a venture capital? Yeah, so maybe just to, to round out the comments, I think it's important to just reflect on the, the benefits of industrial companies and financial companies collaborating in this space. So industrial companies are very attractive to um, institutional investors in this area for three reasons. Firstly, they can provide expertise about what actually works in engineering and marketing. Secondly, they can provide diversified <coughs> portfolios, so to hedge risk and not constrain risk to one particular project or, or technology. And thirdly, they can provide scale-up effects and multiplier effects. I think a very good example of, of how an industry can work and, and, and develop to full commercial scale from zero is the offshore wind sector, where in sort of 15, 10 to 15 years ago period, there was a collaboration between the large industrial companies supplying onshore wind turbines that had the ambition to go offshore the utilities, particularly Danish utilities, who um, saw the opportunity for transformative clean electrons and certain governments and the EU as well. 
At that time, institutional investors were not interested in backing offshore wind because it was seen as too risky and one individual project could fail for a whole host of reasons. But institutional investors were willing to back the industrial companies providing the, the drilling rigs or the, <clears throat> the turbine blades because of the reasons I mentioned. And after uh, five to eight years of experience in these projects actually working, the institutional investors were confident that the projects themselves passed their criteria and decided they were able to go directly into the projects in a sort of second phase. So I think that's a really interesting model to map forward as to how we might be able to build the hydrogen economy um, or um, decarbonize the uh, chipping or ultimately the aviation sectors. Thank you, Ian. We are moving slowly towards the uh, the end of the session, but there is one set of questions that I get from the audience, which also ties well with the point that Willem was making about equity. Um, you all, the three of you, represent different brands of that uh, patient and more, you know, time tolerant uh, capital that Anne was talking about, and it's a I think it's a fascinating definition. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, we have somebody representing um, people who have both a long-term and a short-term perspective. The long-term perspective of the viability of a company and the short-term perspective of satisfying shareholders. But a lot of people in the audience are asking, how do you bring in private capital, which is of a shorter term nature? Or perhaps not inside a shorter term, but with perhaps less uh, less patient um, private in, uh, private sa savings through commercial banks, or also you know if you like more um, uh, more innovative uh, views. One of our uh, listeners was asking, you know, how do you bring in new brands of investors, new categories of investors like you know, cities, prosumers, um, uh, uh, independent producers. How do you bring actors who do may not have the broad shoulders to have the patience that uh, uh, the, the investors you represent uh, may have? Uh, is there a way where you can blend uh, what you do with this form of um, uh, of capital, private capital, and that takes us to the question of equity, uh, because the same issue arises for the companies. Um, it brings us into the whole issue of green bonds. It brings us into the whole issue of, you know, how does a company raise capital uh, for ventures which are promising uh, and perhaps strategically promising, but uh, a bit riskier uh, and a bit more uncertain than uh, what they normally would go for. So I, I, I'll use this as the last um, uh, part of our conversation, and, and I will give the floor to all four of you uh, on on this cluster of issues. And uh, uh, perhaps now let me start with with Marco, and then we go uh, we go around the table. Thanks, thanks, Paul. I'm going to broaden the question because I think the people after me should probably answer. More and more, we are engaged with private equity companies because they start to own our companies. And, and if you understand and see the chemical industry, the one thing that is happening is that we're constantly restructuring, grouping, splitting off again um, assets which are, which are on the ground. It's a constant process where private equity has a big role. I see two types of private equity companies we talk to, and it's new for a trade federation to also talk to the investors into our members. Um, one class is just interested in buying, merging, splitting, cutting, and moving forward. Um, and they're very useful because they, they are, in a sense, a, a, a hygienic process in the sector, um, but they don't focus on climate as such. Now, there's another group who are, um, and you see it in the investors at the funds themselves coming from a chemical background, who are very keen on the opportunity. So they, they almost surgically take one part of the company, try to identify a new market opportunity, but mostly it's market driven. 
both I don't see on the decarbonization targets yet. How to reach those is something where I'd, I'd be happy to hear from, from the, the other speakers as well, because there is quite a large power of change in those people, and they're already in the sector. They're just not, not focused there yet. Um, that's where I, I think for us, um, again, this further dialogue, this understanding on how these investment decisions are made is important. But if you will read the press, you will see a constant discussion of private equity activity in the chemical industry. Um, you just don't see them focused yet on these kind of projects. Um, that's still, so with EIB, um, with, with funds, um, discussions are going. Um, but that group of, of funders um, would be interesting to drill into and to understand better to, uh, to make that change. And maybe the, the last point to say also to something unsaid, if you look at steel, cement and chemicals, and if you take 20,000 companies in my sector, there's about three who have the capacity to develop the electric cracker of the future. Size, um, funding, um, production. The same on blast furnaces in steel. If it would be three companies, I would be surprised. So, and indeed for those, there's no new market afterwards. So the best thing we could have is a race of those three to develop the newest technology. The likelihood that it will come into one consortium which with public support starts to develop this is, is more likely. But then you're in a market where for about a decade, your OPEX is gonna be higher than the rest of the world. That puzzle we also need to solve. Um, if this is not, maybe it's comparable to offshore wind, we need to learn from it, but um, the cracker of the future, the blast furnace of the future, the cement kiln of the future will be a one-off. Um, it would be nice if two different technologies are developed and one wins, but it's as, as risky maybe as the offshore wind uh, described. We don't have the understanding yet how we can kickstart that besides research project, which is not it uh, at the moment. So two comments, one on private equity, one on the, um, the challenge we have ahead of us. Um, and as I said, really happy to, to further connect on that because we're trying to solve the puzzle. We don't have all the answers yet. Thanks, Marco. Bear in mind that we are determined to surprise you. Uh, let me now ask uh, uh, Willem first. What's your take on all this? Well, uh, the, the commission was rather courageous in presenting the MFF proposal. And one part was uh, the solvency support instrument, which is not there any longer after the European Council had made the final decision. I find this a pity because this was an ambitious, ambitious target. Um, let's see what finally the negotiations will, will bring. But as I've said, I see for, for EAB group also a role to play in this. The EAB will concentrate in the future clearly on this uh, Paris alignment and the climate target based on the, on the products that the EAB always is offering, that the debt in, that's the debt instruments and the guarantee instrument. The EAF, the, the subsidiary, is very much engaged via intermediaries in the seed financing and in the venture capital market. But thanks to FC, again, EAB has developed also new products, rather creative product, uh, products. Uh, we, we call it venture debt. That's something I would say equity-like. And this was really most welcome from companies, smaller companies, mid-cap scaling up uh, startup companies. That's extremely important. We are not allowed to do direct equity because that's not our business and that's not our competence, but we will do more via intermediated, intermediated uh, 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 private capital, uh, private equity funds. And therefore, I think the capital market is an extreme important partner also for the industry, for the businesses, but also for public institutions like you commission and, and EIB. And Marco had an important point, I think also for the private for the private investor, a certain guidance of private capital towards, let's say, sustainable targets, towards climate-oriented targets, would be extremely would be extremely helpful also to give the right incentives in this direction. By the way, incentives, one of the most important ones will be the carbon pricing also to give the right incentive for, for private in investors. You made a point, Mauro, I will, I will um, tackle quite briefly, 
You mentioned the funding side. The EIB are one of the largest, let's say, actors on the capital market. You will join us rather soon as commission and ESM is also there. And what we see more and more that you have, you can attract private capital via green bonds and sustainable bonds. And therefore, I think it's also key for all investors to understand the background of this green, of this green or sustainable component of this bonds issuing. That means it's extremely important to be precise, to be transparent, and also have the proper information about the investments you are going into. And here I can close the circle. It is really necessary to have the clear targets, the predictable regulation, and the sound products. And then also, I think we can attract the private capital to go in the right direction. Thanks, Wilhelm. I trust the audience will forgive me if I eat a bit more into the, the break in this, uh, in this conference. But um, Ian, uh, give us your take on, on this, including your, your last remarks. And then we'll have Anne um, have the last word. Yes, thanks, Mario. Look, a couple of quick ideas to respond to the question. And those ideas are, first of all, blended capital and secondly, phased capital. Willem made a very important point earlier on about additionality. And I think the creativity and um, imagination that those who are running the Innovation Fund and other EU funding mechanisms can bring to bear here is crucial in understanding how to optimise the additionality opportunity and constraint. So in the context of getting new um, technologies to develop, the raising of capital in a blended structure can be really important. The additionality intervention is to understand the constraints and risk tolerance of the more private sector oriented co-investors at the same time and structure the public money to block off or remove those risk elements, for example, through guarantees for um, offtake for um, power projects. So that's the snapshot with blending. The other idea being phased capital is around the financial strategy of the business or project in question. So it may be possible at uh, an early stage with the innovation fund coming in to back a business, possibly alongside some patient capital, for example, from a philanthropic source to have very clear milestones as to what the business should aim to achieve over a short time frame, let's say two to three years, at which point there is an explicit plan to bring in more commercial private sector in a subsequent second phase. And if the dialogue with the providers of such capital starts early, it should be possible to, to bring um, those private sector investors along to, with the journey <clears throat> such that after three years, they know enough about the company to understand the risk better and therefore be more confident about deploying their their private sector monies. But look, really appreciate the opportunity to join this conference. Fascinating discussion and look forward to uh, further dialogue in the future. Thanks, Ian. I think you hit on one of the issues that we've been struggling with uh, along the lines of what uh, you've all said, uh, understanding what the other actors do. Um, it isn't easy for the Commission to uh, respect its mandate and then bring in early dialogue with the with those who should be the interlocutors in subsequent phases of a project but absolutely we are convinced absolutely necessary it's a very valid point um big challenge for us given our institutional nature uh, and as i promised you, you have the last word and what i agree with with ian and others has been a fascinating discussion Thank you so much. So the pressure is on since I'm between uh, you and the coffee break. Uh, but I wanted to say, I mean, first of all, what we are seeing is uh, there is appetite by uh, sort of investors that have a return expectation to enter in these, uh, in these uh, technologies. Uh, but it tends to be at a later stage. So we are in the process of raising a new fund, but at the late stage development. If we want more investors in the early stages, then I think the Commission could do so if we could credibly prove that we can shorten this innovation cycle. I mean, why do we need this patient capital? Because it takes so long. So if we can, you know, credibly prove that we can accelerate this, we can make this shorter, I think we'd see a lot more investment early on. And this is really something to keep in mind. 
The third thing that hasn't come up, but which I recently learned a little bit about, is about sovereign wealth funds and sort of institutional investors. Um, and they're very much handicapped a little bit um, in the um, investment in these early emerging uh, uh, technologies by the fiduciary responsibilities which they rightly have. Huh? But there is also some rethinking here about, uh, given the climate crisis, maybe some of these criteria need to shift and they do need to bring more of their investments and their capital into these emerging technologies. And it hasn't happened yet. But if it were to happen, that would open up enormous possibilities. And it's something that we should keep in mind. And like the others, I just want to say it was a fascinating discussion. I really, really enjoyed it. And thank you for, for inviting me. And perhaps we shall find another opportunity to, uh, to do that. But um, we have a program to respect, so I must draw this session to a close. Many thanks to all of you. Uh, you've uh, participated with not only with your expertise, your knowledge, but with great gusto. Uh, and uh, I think it's been a pleasure uh, to listen to you and to, and to participate in this discussion. I trust that we will see you again uh, sooner rather than later. Many thanks and have a good day. And I give the floor to my colleagues for the continuation of the uh, of the conference. Goodbye. Bye. Thank you.